Right. Hello. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the new season of the uh, uh, Hong Kong Philatelic Society and Hong Kong Study Circle joint meeting. Uh, this is the first meeting of the new season. And um, I, I, I've seen several, many, in fact, many familiar faces. Um, and uh, I think that, that we're going to have a very good year. And I hope uh, that uh, we, we're going to have some very nice presentations. So I think uh, without further ado, uh, well, of course, I, I, I would like to invite um, Adrian um, from the UK, uh, who has pr uh, uh, prepared something for us this, this evening or this, this, this today. So Adrian, would you like to start? Okay, do you want to share the screen? Yes. Oh, uh, I'll take let mine. me share the screen. Okay, I'll take mine off first. Apparently, this is the first time I've used PowerPoint since I retired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can remember what to do. Right, there you are. Okay. Um, I only started collecting these about a month ago. Um, I found several covers of um, Hong Kong stamps on American um, liners, actually postmarked on American liners. And Webb has a list um, because each postmark has a number with a different ship for, for each ship. Um, Webb's list was incomplete. So by reference um, to uh, various Hong Kong stamps, but also American covers, which are far more numerous. Um, and by reference to um, the uh, a society that specializes in these, I've managed to, to find out um, the complete list, even though I can't actually show you every one. I don't think you'd want to be here that long anyway. Um, so let's get started. Whoops, here we go. So the dollar line actually was was founded to, um, is that in the way? Yeah, was founded to move um, timber for a lumber yard in, in um, in Canada um, in around 1895. And then in 1902 started a service from Seattle to Yokohama and Manila, um, also stopping in, in um, Kobe, Shanghai and Hong Kong. In the 1920s, they expanded very fast. The dollar line bought the Admiral Orient line um, and they bought a number of ships like the one you see here, which is a postcard that was sold on board as a generic postcard because uh, eight of the ships were of, um, of one particular type. Built by the American government, actually, after the First World War, designed as troop carriers and then fitted out as luxury liners. So we're there effectively a wartime reserve to carry troops. Um, so they bought seven of the 502 type, which is 502 feet long. I think they bought eight of the 535 type, which were 535 feet long. Later, they added a, a world service uh, and a route via Honolulu. Um, so you do see these covers with stamps from Cuba uh, and other places. Um, on board, I would I would hazard a guess that they sold American stamps given the, the preponderance of American covers. Um, but if they stopped somewhere like Hong Kong, you could buy stamps in Hong Kong and use them on board the liner. 1938, the dollar line got in trouble, was partly bought out by the American government, became the American president line. Um, but the dollar family uh, still had uh, an interest um, at their peak, you can see they carried 45,000 passengers a year. So the American covers are fairly plentiful. Um, the postmarks um, are those where the ship's number is in the lozenge. A lozenge is designed to obliterate the stamp. 
Um, these are three types that Webb um, illustrated. They tended to have like the first example here, west or east. Most of my, in fact, all the covers I have are this first type, apart from one. Um, the earlier covers from the early 20s sometimes had RMS or in them or a, a, just a solid um, lozenge. But we're interested here in those with a number, a numbered ship. So the first type has west or east, but it was meant to denote the direction of travel of the ship, but was often ignored and uh, fairly random whether they're west or east. Um, the second type looks very much like the Manila postmark stamps, which I also collect, where they have the date just between the lozenge and, and the postmark. This is a very American style of postmark. So no doubt was dictated or even provided by the American Post Office. Um, this more Manila type has a circle around the number um, without west or east. And then finally, there's a type without the circle around the number, but with the west or east. Um, Webb shows this, this type six without the west or east. But you can see that there was clearly a gap for it. So the fact, you know, they, they just left it out on one occasion or more than one occasion. So um, the first postcard I picked up was President Jackson, which um, Webb had given a provisional number one to, um, built 1921. All of these ships were built by the government and therefore named uh, they were named as the nicknames of the states. I think the Silver State might be Nevada, I'm not sure. Um, and then when bought by the dollar line, uh, were renamed the president's name. Uh, they then, um, many of them uh, had their proper, the, the ships were reverted to their original design for the Second World War. This became the attack transport ship, USS Zeitlin. Um, some, there's a picture there of the ship in the First World War. And um, these were designed to, to land troops under fire. Um, this particular ship was dive bombed at Guadalcanal, hit by a kamikaze plane um, off the Philippines. Um, and, and was also in the Iwo Jima. Eight times the ship came under fire. Uh, she then reverted to President Jackson and, and was scrapped in 1948. So that's the first one. That confirms Webb's provisional entry of, of number one for President Jackson. The next cover I'm showing, uh, Webb already had four as, as the number for this. Um, I would like to to get a complete, or at least images of, of the complete set, um, if if they indeed they exist for Hong Kong stamps. Uh, this one was a Keystone State, originally renamed President McKinley. She was a 535. Uh, they carried 835 passengers as a liner, but nearer 2,000 troops as a troop carrier. Um, so, yeah, this this had eight. Uh, this this ship came under fire six times in the Second World War, um, through through to Okinawa and Japan. Again, renamed back to President McKinley after the war and, and scrapped in forty eight. The next um, cover is not of this series. This uh, cover, although I bought it just to prove that. Uh, six was the President Roosevelt, but is not in fact the uh, in service in the East. This was in service between um, the East Coast of America and Germany. And this is the USGERC post. That's a different line, didn't go to the Far East, did have number six. Um, Webb put a question mark by the number six, I found no evidence it was used in the Far East, uh, but it was used 
um, across the Atlantic. Similar postmark mark type, but different shipping line and didn't come to Hong Kong to my knowledge. So that confirms that six should be ruled out. The next one is an American cover. So I haven't yet seen um, number 17 uh, on the Hong Kong cover. It is, but this shows that 17 is attributed to the uh, SS President Garfield. Um, renamed the Madison after Garfield was sold in 1940. Um, she was actually in Manila when war broke out. The passengers helped paint the ship grey. Uh, the Carpenter built a wooden gun to stop um, to stop um, submarines from surfacing because a surface submarine can outrun a ship, but one underwater can't. Uh, she then had radio silence to get back to the States. They thought she'd been lost. She arrived back in New York. 92 days later. Um, again, she became a hospital ship, sold in, um, served in the Pacific and, and was scrapped in 1948. The next, these, um, this piece was, uh, was actually in the John Bull auction in June. Had I known I would start collecting these, I would have bid for it. The cover is mine though, which shows uh, much more clearly that 18 was actually the President Wilson, which was one of the missing numbers from Webb's list. Um, this uh, ship was sold to the Spanish and, and managed, therefore, to survive the Second World War right to, through to 1959. Um, another one in the same lot in, the John, in John Bull in June was 19. This Webb had already attributed to the SS President Lincoln. Um, there's a picture here of, of her as, uh, as a liner. I don't know if that's Seattle or New York. Um, again, this ship was sold to the Spanish and, and survived until 1958. Um, the next is the President Pierce. Here uh, is a postcard that I have. Um, an existing attribution by Webb to, to number 22. Um, this ship actually did the round world surface, so you, you can find um, stamps from many countries with this postmark. Um, uh, she actually did a, a secret State Department mission to Hong Kong and Shanghai in 1941 um, and was then converted into an attack transport was sunk by a German sub submarine uh, during the invasion of North Africa. Um, the next one is the President Polk, uh, another gap in in Webb's in Webb's list. I've uh, I've got this cover that uh, shows that the Polk was was number twenty four. Um, she uh, was eventually uh, destroyed by Japanese aircraft during the Second World War. The next is the Van Buren. Um, so probably a, a harder one to find. Um, I'll just uh, look through my notes. Um, so the Van Buren, yeah, was renamed President Fillmore. There are actually three President Fillmores in this line, so you have to number them one, two, and three. Um, uh, but she was renamed the third President Fillmore after they, the line had sold the second President Fillmore. Um, survived a number of attacks at the Suez, including a dud that landed 15 feet from her and was kicked into the water by a sailor. Um, shot down a number of attackers, uh, uh, attacking Japanese bombers and fighters, uh, and was strafed in, in, in the Aleutian Islands. Um, this is an interesting postmark. So although it doesn't, um, you, you can't actually see the number, 
the TPO and CPO Society have confirmed that 25 was used for the Van Buren. But the center of this postmark is inverted and it doesn't follow any of Webb's particular postmark types. So an interesting postmark. Um, more detail about the Van Buren. Um, there's a picture of her as a hospital ship. She was actually the first Allied ship to arrive in Japan um, at the end of the Second World War and was there when the instrument of surrender was signed on board the USS Missouri. Um, again, decommissioned, scrapped in 48. Numbers 26 to 28, I don't have any images of. Um, but the TPO and C Post Society have confirmed they were the President Harrison, President Johnson, and President Fillmore, um, respectively. Um, so uh, I've only just started collecting these. So these are three gaps, but I do have the attribution and numbers from, um, as I say, the TPO and P C Post Society. So here you have the, the updated list um, with the in green. Uh, the, the completion of those numbers that uh, uh, that Webb didn't have or had question marks against. Um, if anyone has any of these, with particularly with Hong Kong stamps, I'd, I'd be very interested in, uh, in yeah. seeing pictures of them. Thank you, Adrian. I have a, a six on a King George V Hong Kong eight cent. Ah. That's interesting. So which ship? Well, number six. Does is there a circular postmark that tells you the ship? It's, name? it's on a piece, it's not on an envelope. There's only a, a corner. Ah. That could be a Manila postmark. It's I've, it's a perf in Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. Yeah. I have um a six um Manila postmark. But uh, if particularly if Particularly if it has a date down just bottom left below the... No, it, no, I can't read that it. Bit. Yeah. Be interesting to see. It could be Manila Postmark. There were there were a couple of these uh, on eBay uh, a few months ago. Yeah, the prob a few months ago. All oh, right. So in the yeah, last month, I bought several. The last month. Oh, you bought one last month. Yeah, yeah. One, one was last month. Because I, I've yeah. been... Uh, looking at the uh, the sold list of things and looking for interesting items. But there were, yes. I noted there were one or two. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, if you see um, anything on the sold list that I've missed. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you can send me your email address, I'll scan it and send it to you to have a look at. Yeah, that's 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 great. Um, well, I can tell you my email address. It's Wayne Forth. W-A-Y-N-F-O-R-T-H-S, plural, at protonmail. Okay. Dot com. Protonmail? Yeah, protonmail, all one word. Okay. Adrian, Adrian, for your number six, Manila, does it have a date on it? Yes. Okay, then you can find out and confirm it's the ship. Well, I I think it's a Manila postmark. Doesn't matter. Uh, all than... the, the dollar line went via Hong Kong to Manila. Yeah, rather um, than the ship uh, postmark. Because you get the postmark, if you have the, the circle, it says Manila. Oh, I and see. And they do numbers one through to six posted mm. at um Franked in Manila. That, that's not necessarily a dollar line ship. It could be. Um, but these covers are the ones actually posted on board with the dollar line ship in, in the sure. circular postmark. Sure, sure. You could you you can actually get the ship movements from Manila online. Yes. Yeah. The website called Trove Australia. Oh, 
How do you spell that? I think it's T R O V E. Groves. They have they have the Manila newspapers. Ah, right. Good. So that there are there any more than thirty? Sorry. Are, you, are there any more than numbers bigger than thirty? Not to my knowledge. Ah, okay, right. Uh, there weren't any more ships, so I've That's looked right. at all the ships in those lines. Yeah. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Yeah. Um, I've looked at all the the list of ships in those lines. I've I've accounted for all the ships, and I've accounted for all the numbers that Webb thought was were used. Mm. And they match, luckily. Uh, 30 is quite a big fleet already. Well, numbers 6 through to, what was it, 14 or so weren't used. Well, they were used by another line. They weren't used by... Oh, okay, okay. Right, line. right. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Good, yeah. Great study. Uh, anyway, I wasn't aware that there was a complete list. I asked Andrew and he no. said he, he wasn't aware of one. So there you go. The, the, that's no, thanks. The list. Yes. Any questions? So, so, so you 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 told us that the um, the ships actually got um, a U.S. stamps, of, obviously, on board. So, so anybody on board the ship could actually go to the ship, or maybe the purser, or there's a, actually a ship post office that you can actually uh, send some postcards, something to your friends. Um, yes. But what, why 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 were there some some uh, uh, letters franked with uh, say Hong Kong, uh, or maybe you, you did mention Cuba? So. So the, they must, the stamps must have come from the, the passenger. So the passengers, yes. They must have bought yeah. them mm. or had them on them when they embarked. Yeah, yeah. Do you think they care whether the, the rate is correct or just because packet boat mail is something <laughs> very interesting that you, you whatever stamp you stick on, you know, they, they'll cancel it and then the, and then the, uh, yes. they even didn't bother to check the, check the, uh, the correct rate. In, in, in theory, if you were posting a ship on board under UPU rules, mm. while you were at sea, it had to be stamped with the postmark with the stamps of the um the sh of the country where the ship was registered. Mm. But when it was in port, mm. it had to be um stamped with the stamps of the place where it was in port. So ah, in theory, so... while the ship is sailing across the Pacific, they've got to use American yeah. stamps. Yeah. But when it's at anchor in Hong Kong Harbor, it has to use Hong Kong stamps. Yeah. I, I say in theory because yeah. that is not what one sees in practice. I mean, <laughs> I, have, I have seen Rhodesian stamps on packy bow covers well if you know of course Rhodesia is a totally internal area so <laughs> yeah see that that was the the theoretical system uh, for packy bow working well in practice the person probably accepted any stamp stuck on a postcard or leather yeah and and then to 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 fung it fung it uh, uh, to to the next port of call ah uh, very interesting Right. Any 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 further questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you, Adrian. Um, well, you could of of course uh, consider a, a, a publish as, a, your findings in the, in the next journal. Of the, I'm sure. Next yeah, and that might happen. might enable yeah. yeah more people to uh, yeah to That's right. to let you see what they've got. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I'm sure that you know there are people who say maybe just collect it not just for the dollar line and maybe just uh you know they're collecting you know foreign cancels on Hong Kong stamps or something. You know, and, uh, yeah. Arrival cancellation. Like they they might have a few surprises for you. Yeah. I think it's it's, it's a good idea to publish your findings anytime. All right, okay, thank you very much, Adrian. Uh should we move on to Sarah? I'm not an expert on share screen, so we'll give it a go. Okay. Well, you see the green button. Okay. Button. Has that come up? Yeah. It's come up? No, it hasn't. No? Right. 
Well, first of all, you put your file on your computer first. Well, I've done that. You've done it. All right. Yeah. Yes. So has it come up now? No. No. Okay. I'll try again. Nah. No. Yeah, if you press share screen, I have. you can see I have. all your files on your desktop. And you click on that file and they'll come up. Mm -hmm. No? <laughs> Hold you... on, try once more. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Uh, okay. Sarah, do, do you see do you see the share screen the green, green button. button at the bottom of your screen? Yes. So if you press that, you yeah. sh we should see your screen. Uh, no, it's not working because I've got two screens, so it's just bouncing between them both. Ah, right. It's still not coming up? No. Okay, share screen. No. All right, go to the next person then and I'll try again. <laughs> after. All right. Okay, you try again, okay, later maybe. Yeah, okay. So um, uh, I, I suppose it's, uh, as Richard, your, your, your turn comes early. <laughs> if you're ready. Okay. Well, I'm in the same boat as Sarah, so watch out. Um, <laughs> Let's have a look. Ah, hey, oh, you've done it. You've right. done it. Okay. I've done this. I did this before you. No, no. Now we've got Sarah's <laughs> now. I've, have I stuffed up yours? No. No. no, no see my screen? I suspect Andrew's just allowed his screen to be shared. And yours was already there. I don't know. I think both 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 of you actually simultaneously opt up. So and I'm <laughs> I'm actually, are we actually seeing uh, uh, Sarah? It must be uh, Hong Kong King George's fifth sixth cent. That's mine. Mine. Oh, that's yours. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, sorry, I didn't mean Sarah's to. Sarah's more than welcome. <laughs> that's strange because right. I've got a notification that I'm viewing Sarah's screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't mean to hijack you. Sorry. Okay. Can I tell you about it then? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, well, that's the that's the 12 cent, the King George V 12 cent with the upper right-hand character with the damage. Now, it's also found on the, on the King Edward VII 1904 12 cent, which was, yeah, 1904. And then it's found on the 12 cent um, Hong Kong multiple crown CA. So the multiple crown CA appeared in 1916 and 17, and the King Edward VII was in 1904. So there's a big gap between those. And then it it's found on the China overprint 12 cent, which was requis two requisitions in 1916 or 17. So there's a, and then finally it's been found on the multiple script CA 12 cent again in 1933. That's requisition J, um, Andrew. You know that. That's um, so. It's there's a huge gap between it. I mean, did they use the same plate for since 1904 with the King Edward the Seventh one, right the way up to the requisition J, which was in 1933? Seems extraordinary that they would have used the same plate for such a long time. Anyway, um, I don't know. And here's here's one that. I think is an effort to repair the damage. You see the, the blob there. Um, is this? I'm seeing a six cent, sorry. It's 12 cent. Oh. Oh, is it's, it? Is it? Okay. It's an art, <laughs> unless I unless I've managed to give you the six cent. <laughs> oh, right. That's your screen, isn't it? Yeah, it says Sarah's screen, yeah. Well, hopefully, I'm showing you the twelve cent. <laughs> no, you showed me the eight, six cent. I'm showing you between the character. That's what I'm seeing. You're seeing the six cent. Yeah. 
Right. Well, let's let's just uh, keep you <laughs> on on your toes. <laughs> um, the sixth sense was coming next, but you seem to have got it early. Anyway, so that that's the twelve sense. Now we'll give it a go and show you this the sixth sense. Um, there you go. Have I, I swapped onto the sixth sense? Can can the rest of you see the sixth sense? Yes, yeah, I can see that. Okay, well, I've still got the 12th cent on the screen, which is very confusing. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, can you see the 6th cent with the, the joined legs error? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yes. Okay, now that's been found on the overprint. Um, Ian Gibson-Smith has it on the overprint. Um, multiple script CA, which is requisition F 1921. And then it's also on the, um, the multiple crown CA, the Hong Kong issue. I found that, but I don't know what requisition that is or anything. And and then on the Hong Kong issue again, um, between 1912 and 1918, it, it appeared. So again, it's a very big gap between 1918 and 1921, three years. Um, but the sixth cent had a lot of funny splodges and, and joined up and and strange things appearing on it. Can you see the what the ones I'm showing you now? Mm -hmm. No. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, anyway, um, if it, if you, any of you have that six cent with the joined legs error, um, I would I would really like to see. Let or let me know. What I'll do is I'll put my email in the chat box. Mm -hmm. How about that? Then you can yeah, find yeah. it. Is it just an ink okay. block? Or, or just damage on the plate, plate damage? Well, unless we find more, you know, if it's only the one off, then it's probably an ink blob. Mm. But if lots of people have, then it might be damage. Mm. Mm. Um, that's why it's interesting to know if other people have it. Mm. I'm sorry, Susan's not there. Mm. Um, Steve and Luke has, has, has a great, has a few of them, but I wondered if anyone else had them too. So would you have a look? Mm. Okay. okay, I'll I'll stop the share and I'll put my email address in the chat box. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Great. So. So if uh, if anybody got any examples, uh, just give uh, Sarah drop Sarah a line. Send yes, scan. Please. There you go. Ah, good. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That was clever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's good to get something right. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Okay, who's next? Yeah. Okay, so uh, back to uh, Richard now. Now, Sarah, you have to, you have stops to get shared. Okay, so Richard, job. Need to be that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, my. I'll start by apologising. I meant to do a lot more work mm. on this, but uh, it's basically an attempt to give an overview. I'm sure at least one of two of you know as much, if not more than me, about King George the Sixth definitives and uh, centenary issues. But uh, the thing that I have to show uh, is this. This is, uh, in my humble opinion, um, the stamps that were at the General Post Office in Hong Kong on the last day of February 1946. Paper 
is Crown Agent's paper used by the post office. And then perhaps that's interesting in itself, but um, if I run through each of these stamps, and then perhaps that would give you a, an overview of something that I've been working on for what seems like an eternity. Um, I'll have to refer to my notes, so I have to put my glasses on, excuse me. The, starting in the top left, the one cent, well, the one cent uh, KG6 adhesives, there were none when uh, in the post office or in its vaults or wherever you want to call it, uh, when the British took over the um, post offices from the Japanese in August uh, 1945, and there were none. Um, that continued through until the end of, at least the end of 1945. The Postmaster General, uh, Mr. Harris, who was the incumbent under the British military um, administration, um, reported the fact that there were still none in uh, mid-December 1945. But by February 46, then there was one. And this is a perforation 14. And this was part of the first indent or requisition after the war, um, requisition D. And this uh, arrived in a late January or the very, very beginning of February. The, the one cent was also uh, printed by the firm of Williams, Lee and Co. as part of uh, emergency printings due to uh, the bombing of Delaru. Uh, but this stamp was uh, sent from Williams Lee and never arrived in Hong Kong. I can explain that in much more detail um, in some future episode or whatever. So this one is explained. The two, the two, two cents um, is a very common stamp used on covers immediately post World War II. In fact, there were nearly 12,000 sheets of this, this stamp uh, in the postal office uh, when the British took over from the Japanese. But they were from Requisition Z. They were perforation 14 by 14. And this two cents appears on, I think you will find it in combination with the five cent centenary and the eight cent Requisition B uh, on virtually all first day of opening of the post office in September 1945. However, there, there was also a two cent with perforation 14 and a half to 15 by 14, um, printed by Bradbury Wilkinson in New Malden, which is where I'm sitting now, um, in their premises, which is now my local Tesco. Um, but these, there were many dispatches or a number of dispatches sent from 
Crown agents and Bradbury Wilkinson in 1941. Uh, some made it out. Um, well, none of them actually made it to Hong Kong, but some were diverted to Australia, Sydney. Um, they were on board the Blue Funnel Line Adrastus. Uh, which was on its way to Hong Kong um, because of the Japanese invasion that diverted to Australia. And another lot was uh, diverted to Durban in South Africa. Um, this they were sent on the Ben Line, Ben Vanoff, uh, via the Panama, originally meant to be going to Hong Kong via the Panama Canal, but um, it had all sorts of engine trouble. Um, we eventually was diverted from South America to Durban, where you know, the, these were unloaded and kept in the vaults there. Both both of those um, set, sets, there were 3,000 sheets of this stamp at each location. Uh, they were sent on to Hong Kong after uh, the liberation. I don't, I'm not 100% sure when the South African ones arrived, but the Australian ones arrived on the 19th of November, 1945 on HMS Smiter, an aircraft carrier. The four cents is a little bit of an enigma. It is also uh, perforation 14 and a half, 15 by 14. And this one, it's not 100% certain where it was actually printed. Hmm. At the takeover of the post office from the Japanese in uh, August 45, there were nearly 65,000 sheets of four cent. Uh, adhesives, which is more than were actually part of the requisition B, which is the normal uh, 14 and a half by 14, which is this one. So there were also some remnants from the previous requisition, which would have been perforated 14 by 14, uh, requisition Z. The thing about this stem is that although it it fortuitously, uh, many, many of them arrived in Hong Kong. They were put in the vault and not used. Um, and in fact, they did not come into use in Hong Kong until, well, the earliest date that I know of is mid-January 1946. So not long before this piece of paper appeared. But why, why was this? Well, good question, but okay, I'll try to answer that later on uh, when I do a proper presentation of this. But interestingly, the first local rate uh, for Hong Kong post-war is recognized as being five cents per ounce. But in actual fact, the postal administration announced that it was four cents. And they changed it uh, one day later. Why did they do this? Well, the four cents they had, as I just mentioned, a whole heap of uh, sheets available. Uh, the five cents they had a lot of sheets of the centenary available to them when they reopened the post office. So they opted to go for the five cent one instead of four cent rate. So moving quickly across to the five cent green definitive, This definitive did not arrive in Hong Kong 
before the Japanese. In fact, the only five cent adhesive at that time was the centenary one, which there was a, a, a shipload. There were about well, just over 48,000 sheets of this stamp sitting there uh, waiting for the British to take over from the Japanese. Customarily, I think you probably all know that if there were commemorative uh, adhesives available, then they were put on sale first rather than the definitives, which were held back until they were uh, run out of, uh, of them. And that seems to be the situation here because there are also five cent stamps uh, diverted to Australia and South Africa in the same way, 3,000 sheets in each location again. And there were also uh, stamps sent out by air in August 1945 from the Crown Agents uh, in UK. And also uh, there were stock sent out that were held in London for dealers. They were all sent out in two batches to Hong Kong in 1945. But they just sat there. They continued to use the centenary one. And I'd be interested if anybody has this five cent adhesive on uh, cover. I, ha I have uh, 21st of May, 1946, which has both the centenary and the definitive. Whereas a 1st of May, 18, uh, 1946, sorry, only has the centenary. So that, that is why I've said that this piece of paper was uh, what the post office had in their stock. It's not a reflection of what was being sold over the counter because this five cent definitive was not. And you will see many people who went into uh, the post office to get all the available stamps and then send them to their themselves via their wife or whatever uh, in UK or elsewhere. So, uh, for example, I have a October 1945 uh, 15 cent postal stationery envelope, which which ha basically has all of most of these uh, stamps, but does not have the five cent green. Okay, so I'd be interested if anybody has anything before May 46 on cover. May 46. Um, moving on to the next one is the eight cents. Well, I think Ingo, Ingo Nestle is the resident expert on the eight cent, but um, this was in requisition B. So requisition B had two stamps in it. One was the four cent and one was the eight cent uh, with different perforations, setups. For my stupid um, mind, that immediately tells me that they were not perforated in the same place. Mm. Um, and the fact that the four cents is identical perforations to the Bradbury Wilkinson and William Lee, uh, sorry, the Bradbury Wilkinson uh, issues suggests to my mind that it may have been perforated there, but there's, nobody else has come forward uh, with any similar or alternative theory. Anyway, the eight, the eight cent, there were not that many sheets in the Crown Agent, uh, in the G General Post Office uh, in 1945. There's only about 5,000 sheets. 
or so. But more came from Crown Agent stock uh, later, and it also formed part of a replenishment exercise in uh, requisition D. The 10 cents, um, there were no 10 cents available in Hong Kong at the post office in August 1945. And this particular one uh, would have arrived either from Australia or South Africa or been flown, probably flown in uh, in one of the two batches from the Crown agents. So it was done as perforation 14 uh, and a half to 15 by 14 uh, from Bradbury Wilkinson. Um, moving on quickly before we bore you all to death. And um, the 15 cents, I don't, there is no record of the number of stamps that were there when the Japanese left, but there definitely were some. They appear on a number of uh, post World War II, 1945 uh, covers and so on. So they're definitely there. And this would have been from the Requisition Z, which, which Requisition Z were printed in 1940, but arrived in Hong Kong first half of 1941. The 20 cent black, which is here, uh, there's no pre-war issue of the 20 cent black. It first made its appearance uh, in 1946, February 1946, 1st of February. So it only just made it onto this sheet of paper, and that was part of uh, requisition D. The first, uh, I, my understanding is the first day of use was 1st of February 1946. Moving on to the 25 cents, these the same case as the 15 cents, really, uh, in that don't know the number of sheets, but definitely quite a number were in the vaults or whatever uh, when the British took charge again in August 45. Again, this 25 cent stamp was, was left sitting in the vaults or wasn't and wasn't used until the registration uh, started up again on the 24th of October 1945. Uh, we know that the, the fee for registered mail was 25 cents. So it reappeared round about that time. So they didn't really introduce, they didn't really introduce higher value ones until the, they were needed or they thought they were needed. This uh, 25 cent blue was, of course, uh, replaced by the new color, uh, olive green, in uh, September of 1946, requisition E, which was the second post-war requisition from Crown Agents. Moving on to the 30 cents, there were none, none in the post office when the British came back. Um, this stamp was uh, Bradbury Wilkinson from my local Tesco, and uh, they were sent out by air from the Crown agents. They had a, a stock that they'd held, and they also had stock that they uh, had allocated to dealers. And they, they, these were all sent out, as were, um, again, 3,000 of each uh, from South Africa and uh, Australia. Again, the use of this adhesive after the war, I find it difficult to find on anything uh, before March 
1946. So there's a period from September through to March, six months, where it may not have been used. The 50 cents, again, was Bradbury Wilkinson, but for a change, there were none on board the ships that uh, were diverted to Australia or South Africa. And none uh, in the post office when the Japanese were replaced by the, the British in August 45. But these uh, stamps, including this one, would have been sent uh, in by the Crown agents from their, their stock that they had through the war in probably August, September 45. And then you will find these stamps coming to collect me. Um, they are normally found starting from when uh, airmail was reintroduced in October 45. Then the $1, one dollar um, was printed by emergency printing Williams Lee and Company. And again, there were none of these uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in the post office uh, in August 45. It was on chalky paper, 14, perforation 14, and was part of requisition C. The Crown agents did, did have about 2,000 sheets of this stamp, which they sent out. Um, and it seemed to have arrived uh, early October 1945. Stamps not on this paper that were also part of the Williams Lee uh, printing with $2 and $5 and $10. And with the exception of the $2, which I'll come to in a moment, the $5 and the $10 never, never arrived in Hong Kong and have never been seen. That's not the same for the $2 where we know uh, from requisition blocks of the existence of these uh, $2 stamps from requisition C. Very, very few, and all within a very limited range of sheet numbers. I have my own theory about what happened in this, but essentially these, these stamps were looted. But they obviously, uh, if they were looted, they arrived in Hong Kong. They were not looted uh, from you know, the Middle East or something or whatever. And that in itself is quite a mysterious uh, occurrence because in 1945, there was some, uh, there was a furrow over the looting of these dollar stamps, one dollar, two dollar, five dollar, and ten dollar. There were court there was court cases, and also they were taken off the list of accepted uh, stamps for use on mail, unless uh, they were bought over the counter. Because as I just mentioned, the, some of the one dollar ones were sent out and were used on airmail, principally, covers. But it seems that the only value that arrived in Hong Kong was this $2 one. And from my knowledge, it did not um, get, get into uh, the GPO's vault. So therefore, something happened before it it arrived there, or it could have arrived there. And uh, if if there's a particular interest, I can uh, 
I can put forward the the theory of all of this uh, in some future presentation, but it would take quite a little bit of time, of course. Richard, um, are you talking well, when you say two dollar? Are you talking about the pre-war two dollar, or the, yes, the the, the uh, orange and green? Well, yeah, they, they changed they changed the colors yeah. of the dollar values because yeah. of because of this issue of mm -hmm. looting. And the the new colors, which were a, a scramble of the old colors, but just on different values. They yeah. just swapped the values around. Um, that first day of that, I think it was the 9th, 8th or 9th of April, 1946. In fact, the $2 and the $5 and the $10 arrived at the same time as the 20 cent black. Mm -hmm. They were in requisition D, which arrived in February. And even though they were stated to be extremely urgent please you know pull out all the stops and all that kind of stuff they didn't use them probably because the the delivered numbers were in quite small quantities and it's quite a number of times in the past before the uh, in their past um the post office had got burnt by starting to use um, small quantities that had arrived and then nothing else arrived to sort of keep them going. I think that happened with the centenary issues uh, where they kept running out of uh, values, which is why, which is why probably you find on the centenary values what appear to be like first day covers at various points in time. Um, but, but I digress. Um, so, so, Richard, can I ask, what did the post yeah. office do in the absence of two, five, and ten dollars? What did they use? Large blocks of one dollar, or yes, yes. But if, frankly, the two dollar was uh, quite well used, but on uh, Pan-American airmails, which were $2.80 and then $3.50. And then after the war, um, they they started at the $1 and then changed to two, $2 for uh, air throughout flights, uh, uh, mails, excuse me. So the $2, the $5, and the ten dollar were not particularly commonly used. Um, thus, thus their uh, rarity even before the war. Well, I hope, hope that. Um, so, that. Richard, why, why do you think the Japanese authorities allowed the stocks to uh, survive uh, during the uh, occupation? <laughs> very good. Very good question. In fact, they went out of their way to point it out to Wynne Jones when he first went to inspect the post office after he was initially released from Stan internment camp. Um, but you can extend, you could extend that argument to why did some survive and some didn't. For example, only the five cent centenary issue uh, survived through the Japanese occupation, um, whereas all the rest, some of which had, um, they'd run out of stock. But you can still see on like detained covers, the one dollar centenary uh, being used. So presumably, they were in the post offices when the Japanese arrived. So, uh, and in the in the court case, I read, I have read. The account of one court case of uh, stamps that were looted. And the controller of posts, uh, Fitches, was on record of saying that 
the vault, the GPO vault, was actually uh, broken into, but it, there were, the wall was two foot thick. And he himself reportedly threw away the vault keys to stop them getting into Japanese hands. But your question is a very good one. Why, why were some taken and some not? Or were, was there some other explanation? My explanation for the $2 one, where we see some requisition blocks, is that they were looted before they got to post office. I think they arrived on a boat the day before the Japanese invaded. And I think in the chaos, they may have uh, just ended up um, wherever. <laughs> but I think I need to explain that more fully at some future, future point. Because um, the research that I've done has been a lot of it has to be to do with existing requisition sheet numbers, existent ones, ones that do not exist, and why, um, which I've, hopefully I have almost come to the bottom of uh, after a lot of uh, pain. <laughs> um, so I think that's, that's, that's about it. But if there's any further questions, I'm delighted to. Try and answer. Julie, excuse me, I'm going to bed. Oh, okay, good night, Sarah. Good night. Sorry, yeah. sorry to inflict that on you. That's all right. No, it's my fault. It's past midnight. It's past midnight here. Yeah, I'm, I'm asleep. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Sleep good well. Good night. Good night. Okay. Um, I, I like to sorry. ask. I like to ask yeah. a question, uh, Richard. Uh, you, you you mean that? Uh, this sheet actually is an official record of the stamps available at well on that particular day. I believe post, so. It's a post office record. I believe so. Mm. Mm. But I I can't uh, prove it to you no. one hundred percent. I mean, I two things or three things. These are the stamps, as I mentioned earlier. That yeah. were in the hands of the post office. Okay. Okay. And because and they were not the ones on sale. Not, because, not the ones on sale. Oh no. The five the five cent green, yeah, I don't think was on, on okay. sale, for example. Okay. okay. So that's uh, their stock at the time. Even I think the 20 cents um and so on. They they came out later mm. than the 28th of February. Yeah. That's the first, point, the first point. The second point is it's on Crown Agent's paper. Yeah. Well, I don't think too many people in February 46 had their hands on no. uh, Crown Agent's paper you mean you and, and the Victoria Charles. Wow. It's watermark. It's watermarked. Yeah. Wow. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. So I think it. I think it was. Why the twenty eighth of February? Well, I can only say it's the last day of, was the last day of the month, and yeah. maybe there are other sheets, uh, yeah. also, uh, around somewhere. You. The you transition. Think one every day, or just just this right. particular day. Do you I think the other dates exist? With this, the, all the stamps, or is just a, this is just the, the only one? I, I don't know. It's the only one I know of, but oh. that doesn't mean very much. Okay. All right. Um, I can, I would have thought that there was a there would be at least one of these for when um, mm. the post office administration transited from the military mm. to back to the civilian in. Uh, when was that? Yeah. March? March or May, I can't remember. 46. May. Yeah. May. Awesome. May. May, yeah. Thank you, Simon. Yes. So, hey, Richard, I would have, Richard? I would have uh, yes. 
Yeah, Richard, uh, just a quick question. I'm surprised that given the the stocks that were in the vault when the Japanese took over, that they didn't deface the portraits and use the stamps. Because that's what we saw in the Dutch Indies, right? They they yeah. they defaced the uh, the portrait of the Queen in, of of the Netherlands in uh, in the Dutch Indies, and I, I'm not sure. I, I I don't recall exactly how soon the Japanese stamps were available for use in in Hong Kong, but there must have been a gap. I I would assume there was a gap, but I've never I can't recall ever seeing any of the Hong Kong stamps being defaced and used. And yeah, with this large stockpile of stamps, you would think that, you know, with wartime shortages and so on and so forth, why not use the supplies that are there, the, the stamps that are there in the vault and just deface them and overprint them and revalue them wherever you have to do, right? So well, just I think, curious. I think Simon, Simon could answer your question on the Japanese one. Going back to the... Uh, this uh, statement from Fitch's, the controller of posts in 1945, about mm -hmm. the vault. He said that someone under the Japanese uh, authorization, obviously, uh, had drilled a hole through the two foot thick wall. Um, and that's when they thought that all these dollar one dollar ones had been. Uh, looted so um the one dollar i have seen examples of sheets of one dollar which have the requisition number cut out mm. now for my uh, thinking the only people who would want to get rid of a requisition number um on a sheet of stamps would be that they don't want people to know which requisition it came from, mm -hmm. um, i.e. Um, they fell off the back of a lorry or some other dodgy thing or looted or whatever. So but the $2 ones, there are a number of requisition blocks or pairs or whatever existing. So. They, that's the difference. So I think, I think that the two two dollar arrived in Hong Kong. The five dollar and the ten dollar did not. The one cent did not. But the one the one dollar. I also think did not arrive. Mm. But, but, but Richard, I, I, I'm talking though that when the Japanese actually occupied Hong Kong, not not afterwards. Uh, I mean, why why didn't they use the, the stocks that were there at the post office during that time? And just well, to I, face I, and to I face the portrait. The, Do you I have any they, idea? I mean, yeah. you know. I think they cleared out the stamps into the vault. The ones they could get at, the ones that they could get at so, uh, easily, but uh, I'm not. I'm not sure to be honest. I mean, so Simon knows. At the time, first... then when the vault was not able to be opened, no, I, I think the really, Japanese must have then introduced their own stamps and urgently. Probably never got I around think to replacing Simon, Simon is our main man on, on the Japanese occupation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that. Um, that that's depends on um, how the Japanese position that occupied territory, and Hong Kong uh, was a little bit special in the eyes of the Japanese. Uh, they 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 positioned Hong Kong as part of the Japanese Empire, so they implemented the Japanese rule, the Japanese government organization, and 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 issued Japanese stamps in, in Hong Kong. Um, you you can compare Hong Kong with the part of Occupied territories like the China or other Asian territories, mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese um, uh, uh, di didn't um, use or didn't use the Japanese stamps in all those occupied territories. But in Hong Kong, they just position Hong Kong as, as part of the Japanese Empire, so they 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 use Japanese stamps instead of all the the mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. a British stamp. I mm-hmm. think that's that's the main 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 reason. Mm, okay. Right. May may I ask, just going back to this question of this as a record sheet, if you like, a a, a post office record sheet. In a sense, it surprises me very much that it got out, and I suspect that if, um, if, if other ones were made at the time, they wouldn't have got out because usually the post offices were so very careful about any leakage at all of postage stamps, and they were accounting. You know, they would account for every single stamp. So I, I, I wonder if. Possibly with military, occup- you know, this being under military government, somebody in the forces managed to lay their hands on it. And then later ones, which were made for the benefit of the civilian post office, um, you know, the, the, the postal officials were uh, more uh, scrupulous. Perhaps, perhaps. I mean, the, the Paris was the PMG sort of. They call, they refer to it in a different way. In the military uh, administration, rolled over as to, as the first postmaster general uh, in the civilian, but not for not for very long. Win Jones then reappeared. But yeah, stranger things have happened for sure. That. <laughs> But I can't. I I thought about this, and I I I totally agree with your point. And I thought to myself, what, who, or what is this? Who did it? Why? And mm. why did they do it? And the only answer that I could come to was that it was actually a, a, some kind of post office thing, or someone in the post office. <laughs> Well, Maybe he just did it, did it for himself or something. Yeah, did it as a souvenir. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, uh, at that time, there were at least one or two collectors who were in the postal administration. Stokes, T.G. Stokes. He was the accountant. Mm. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. R- Richard, your, your Maleficent piece uh, re- reminded me of uh, one one of my items uh, in, in, in my collection. But in fact, uh, when, when I got that item, I have no idea what uh, it is and I am not that interested in all the stamps on it, uh, but in fact, I I, I was focused uh, only on 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 the day stamp, and uh, yeah, yeah uh, sh- 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 shall I uh uh uh, uh share? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, please, yeah, please, please, let me uh get out of here, and I hope uh it can uh, provide you with some food for thought. Okay. This one, uh, basically, um, yeah, has uh, one, uh, ten, 10 stamps of, on it, uh, except the three, uh, uh, including the the one cent, the um, yeah. yeah, the black one, and also the the, the uh, and, and 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 the five cent. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the post office is the FPO one two seven. I'm not sure where it was located. But uh, in fact, I, I suppose the FPO one two seven got all those stamps uh, on the date of the eighth of February, nineteen forty. Yep. Yep. For sure. So in there, what have we got? No one cent. Yeah, no one cent. No five. Uh, no five no cent. Five, no five cent green. No twenty cents black. No, no twenty yeah. cent. Uh. Yeah, cool. Well, I don't, I don't know. Let me see. 
Just give, give me one second. I can show you some others. A... <laughs> so, who said? Somebody said that once. Um, Shall I stop? Stop share. Could you send that one to me? Yeah, sure, sure. I I, I can send it. Yeah, to as you. usual. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me see if I can find. See if I've got it here. Okay. Let me see. Um, can you see that? Yep. This one uh, is the 26th of October, 1945. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ludwig was uh, a radio operator on the USS Douglas Monroe, which was in uh, dry dock, I think. So here you can see this is a 15 cent postal stationary envelope. Uh, I think it's the earliest recorded. Um, so there were some of those lying around somewhere. So I've seen another one uh, a little bit later than that. So here again, what have we got? No one cent. No four cent. Because they didn't, as I said earlier, they for some reason, they didn't bring them out until much later, January 46, even though they were in the vault since 1941. Um, no, no four, four cent, no five cent green, uh, centenary, eight cent, 10, 15, no 20, and then 25, 50, and one dollar. This one dollar would have would have uh, just arrived from Crown Agents. And then let's see what else we got. Probably giving away all these trade secrets here. <laughs> this one, I think, is the earliest date for the one dollar coming from Crown Agents. Twenty fourth of October. So there's, there's quite a few that, and of course, many people did what you showed on your your uh, cover. They went out and said, "I'll have one of every every one you've got, please." But here, you this is you have the two five cents. That's the one that I mentioned earlier, and this is the second of May, forty six. If you want me, tell me to stop if you uh, And then this one, the 1st of May, the local one, no five cents. Green, that is. But it has basically the other ones, and it has the new one dollar, mm. which first appeared, I think, 8th. 8th of April, something like that, 8th or 9th of April. And this is uh, first day cover. I was unable to organize a big enough mortgage to buy this one. So. It's um, a few years ago in an auction house here. But that was the new ones. And this one is dated the 8th of April, whereas in actual fact, the recognized first day was the ninth. But quite often they used to uh, sell the stamps to uh, known people the day before, but usually they didn't stamp them until the next day. And this is the earliest requisition B 
16th of January, 46. So, lots of, lots of different uh, examples. Uh, hang on, this we go. This one is similar, similar one, November 45. That's the bit of paper. This one, again, 9th of March, no, no five cent green. For the 20 cent here. Anyway, there you go. Good. Thank you. Great. Okay, but, can... uh, yeah. Andrew, if you, uh, I mean, I seem to have very, very little time at the moment, but when I do have time, I don't mind to do a, a sort of one hour. Yeah. I think good. it would Let take a, at least one hour to explain all the requisition stuff. Yeah, good. Let me know when you're ready. Just uh, send me an email so I can fix the date for you. Well, it won't be any. Don't don't hold your breath, please. No, no, no. I got the same request from uh, Ingo, who actually recently gave a a, a, a presentation at the um, British Empire uh, 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 Society, yeah. so that he he said that he would uh, do the same uh, sort of uh, presentation here in near future as well. Anyway, yeah. um, anybody got any any comments or any? Uh, anything to say before we go, before we uh, adjourn? But anyway, uh, I've got an announcement to make uh, regarding the, um, uh, I mean, PC is not here uh, tonight, um, but uh, he, he actually asked me to uh, make an announcement that the Hong Kong Telex Society has a new website. I don't know whether you've um, actually received, those of you who are members will receive um, uh, um, a, a, a passcode to to uh, enter the, uh, the website. But basically, you don't really need the passcodes on most things except the archives, the uh, of the newsletters and journals. Uh, the journals you probably got, but the, I think the newsletters is quite an eye open because uh, we've we've managed to uh, uh, found some very old newsletters. Um, Dating back to the 60s and even earlier. I think mean, mm -hmm. late, maybe uh, late 50s or something. So the, I, those I, I don't even, I haven't even got copies of. So I think it's it's a uh, it's a it's a pretty good deal. Uh, you know, you know, going uh, get your password and then and then uh, just go into the website and check it out. And it might be all sorts of information um, there. So, uh, well, you're welcome just to click. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same uh, 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 URL as, as the one before. It is, in fact, this is the third generation um, the website, uh, which is which is actually uh, with, I mean, a, a PC and his uh, group of IT experts have, have done marvelous job uh, making the, uh, the website user friendly as well as very modern looking. Uh, and lots of uh, information there uh, for you to, to check it out. Um, anyhow, uh, well, that's the message. And, uh, and uh, if you have time, just go and uh, have a look. And um, anyway, uh, well, um, well, uh, anybody, anybody got anything to say? Simon, got anything to say? No. You want to say anything? No, Richard. Yeah, Richard. Oh, uh, no, fine, thank you. Nate, Adrian, thank you very much. No, uh, thank you. For yes, I like to uh, thank uh, Vincent and Simon uh, uh, for, for being with us tonight, and of course uh, Sarah, who has already gone to bed. Uh, so um, we will look forward to seeing you uh, uh, next month. Um, but before we end, I'd like to thank the uh, Inter Asian Philately. Uh, uh, for uh, supporting us uh, with with the with the with the, uh, the Zoom the Zoom, and um, 
I hope to see you. I think you know if you are going to any of the exhibitions, I mean you are, you you we can meet up and um, you know, have a chat or a cup of tea or beer. Anyway, uh, anyway, anyway, have a have a nice evening or morning or afternoon wherever you are, and I'll see you uh, next time next month. Okay, peace. Yeah. Goodbye to me. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.